Good morning. My name is Catherine Gagne, and it's my pleasure to deliver this program, The Economics for Success, for you today. I'd like to thank your teacher for inviting Junior Achievement into your classroom. Junior Achievement is a nonprofit organization that is all around the world. In uh, countries such as Kazakhstan right now, there might be students learning the same things that you're going to learn today, or in Peru. And so it costs nothing for your school to be involved in this Economics for Success program with Junior Achievement. And it costs nothing because we are sponsored by the business community. And the business community wants to invest in you because ultimately I think they wanna hire you. So I would greatly encourage you from this day on that you begin to share on your resumes that you participated in the Economics for Success program with Junior Achievement of Saskatchewan. Today, we're gonna to look at everything for where you are right now in your life and where you know you want to go. And what is it? What steps do we need to take to take you from here to where you are headed? So I think as we move along today, we're going to have some fun. We're going to do some exercises. You've got workbooks. Everyone's got a workbook. And we'll, we'll work through some of those things in the workbook. We're going to explore um, how you're made, what sort of interests you have, what's your aptitude, what are some career options, how much is it going to cost you to live out those, and what are some decisions, again, that are going to move you along. There's a great proverb that says, without vision, people cast off restraint and live carelessly. And I want to see you make deliberate steps that you walk deliberately towards some of the goals that you have. So in Junior Achievement, as I said, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, and we offer programs right from grade three to grade 12, uh, talking about business, economics, understanding free enterprise, entrepreneurship, and developing those leadership skills within you. I think if you're going to lead, if you're going to move out from where you are now at grade nine or grade 10 and move with confidence, then we want to have some of those foundational, those fundamental things laid in your lives. And I guess today is a bit like just having you stop, pause, and examine where you're at. So as I said, our programs uh, deal with financial literacy, workplace readiness, and entrepreneurship. And I think we're going to get a little bit of some financial literacy in there, understanding what's a budget, what's a credit rating, how do these affect your lives and the decisions you make, and then also getting you ready for the workplace. So Economics for Success program, again, put it on your resume. It causes you to stand out and say, I went through a junior achievement, and it's important to say junior achievement, Economics for Success program, because employers then, ah, oh, I've invested in junior achievement. I want to interview this person. I want to see what they've learned along the way. And so we're going to try to um, have you examine what life's going to look like after uh, high school and um, the importance of having a mentor, how to create that budget, how to achieve strategies that will, um, or develop strategies that are going to help you achieve your goals. Your workbook, each of you should have a workbook. It's uh, like the one there. We're going to go through that. And again, you know, there aren't any right or wrong answers. This is a place of self-examination. It's a place for you to really start thinking about what makes you unique and how are you going to use that uniqueness to move you forward. You get to choose your own adventure. Let's have a look. just how to go about achieving a goal? Well, there's a really great trick you can use called the goal pyramid. Here's what you do. Draw a big triangle, more or less equilateral. Divide it horizontally into four sections. In the topmost section, write your big ultimate goal. Let's say it's winning a medal at the Olympics. Now, work down from the top. What would you have to achieve in order to be able to get to that ultimate goal? Write that in the second section down from the top. 
In our scenario, we'd have to qualify for the Olympics. Next, think about what you'd have to achieve in order to attain that second tier goal. In our example, it would be training. Go ahead and write yours in the third section. Finally, in that largest, lowest section in the pyramid, we're going to put all those little everyday things you'd have to do in order to be able to get to the next level up. In my example, in order to be able to train effectively, I'm going to need to follow excellent nutrition, get high quality sleep, and be disciplined in my post-workout recovery, which involves things like icing my knees and getting regular massages. Think about all the small but essential daily disciplines you'll have to keep in order to achieve your next level goal. Write all those in the bottom section. Let's do another super quick example. You might set a goal to buy a smartphone. We'll put that up here. Now let's start working backwards. In order to buy a smartphone, you'll need to save money and gain knowledge about the different smartphones available. In order to get there, you'll have to complete your chores and do your research. What do we add in the bottom section? The really important everyday choices go here, like emptying the dishwasher, breaking the leaves, and reading about phone specifics. This is the day-to-day -day stuff, the choices that are going to get you the smartphone up here. To recap, draw a pyramid with four horizontal sections. Think of your big, ultimate goal and work backwards to figure out the choices you can make every day that will set you up for achieving your big, top-level goal. There we go. I want to work through this with you this morning. Uh, on page two of your um, uh, workbook, we have that all drawn out for you. So we have the big ultimate goal. Now I want you to think realistically, what are some things you want to do in life? Ultimately, if we look at our lives, let's say, let's go for 10 years out. What would we like our life to look like 10 years out? Will we have gone to university? Are we in university? Have we started a business? Are we working in a trade? Uh, what is it that you would like to accomplish with your life? Not have, you know, because sometimes we get caught up in, oh, I want to own a house. I want to own a car. And all of those are subsections, I think, of your big ultimate goal. But I want you at this time just to think about your big ultimate goal. Now, what is it that you would need to do to get from where you are now to where you are? So let's start with the top section in your triangle. What is your big ultimate goal. Take a moment, page two of your workbook, and let's begin to, to brainstorm and think about some of those things. So as we're thinking about that on page two, we want to start at the top, at the very top of your triangle, and put an ultimate goal. And then next down, again, in order to achieve that ultimate goal, what would you have to do? So sometimes it's easiest in life to start with the end in mind and then work our way back to the everyday. And that's what this exercise is really doing. So I want you to move on now to the second part of that triangle and think about what it is that you would have to do to achieve that ultimate goal. And then below the next level, I want you to think, what do you have to do to get there? And then on the bottom section that, that lays the foundation for that big ultimate goal, what are the everyday steps that you would have to do? Teachers, you may want to pause right now and just give students time to think that through. I think it's so important that when we begin to think out our lives and we begin to plan uh, for our futures, you know, what we do in today can actually impact our futures. And oftentimes I'll say to people, how do you think owning a cell phone today could impact your ability to buy a house in the future? And students will share a whole bunch of things. I want you guys to think about that right now. Owning a cell phone today, how could that impact your ability to buy a car or a house in the future? I'm sure you have a lot of ideas, but ultimately owning a cell phone today is really a test to see how good you're going to be with credit. 
Are you going to make your payments on time? And I know at this age, you don't have your own personal phone contract, but you will. And that's probably the first level of credit that will ever be extended to you. It is absolutely critical whenever you get credit, be that with a cell phone, a renting an apartment, a water bill, a power bill, that you pay your bills on time because people are watching, there are credit agencies looking and they're recording how faithful you are with credit. And so owning, if you don't make your payments on time and then you go to buy a car or a house, they'll look at that credit report. And if they see that you haven't been faithful, that you haven't made your payments on a regular basis, all of a sudden they may put the brakes on and say you're too big of a risk risk and so i really think that those decisions that sometimes we make today we seem like oh they're we're just in grade nine we're just in grade 10 these, these aren't big impact but they can have a major impact in your life think about right now you're starting to select classes that you're going to take throughout high school well, if you want to be a veterinarian, if that say that was your big ultimate goal to be a veterinarian and all through high school, you never take a science class, you're going to be a little bit derailed. But one of the greatest things about life is that you always get a do over. And if you choose wrongly, you just need to get yourself back on track and choose right and take the next step that gets you towards your big ultimate goal. And so nothing is done that can't be undone. It, it just may delay you or derail you for a bit. But as soon as you know, uh, there's a saying, when you know better, you do better. And so let's get ourselves on track and make the best decisions to get us to where we want to go. The next exercise I want to do is pound, pound on page three of your workbook. And it's a career work cloud, word cloud. And you may have done some of these before. It's basically an aptitude test just to see sort of what areas of interest you might have. Or, or I think a great um, sort of plumb line of success is bringing your life in alignment with that which you enjoy, that which you're good at, and making that your vocation, making that your profession. And when people are able to do that, I walk, once walked into a classroom and they said that um, if you work at something you enjoy, you'll never have to work another day in your life. And there's some truth to that. When you really align yourself, not for the outcome, but for, for the purpose of, of how you are made and fashioned, all of a sudden your work becomes a joy. And so what I want you to do right now on page three in your workbook is just to circle every word that you see here that resonates with you. So if you out in top left, if you enjoy outdoors, yes, I'm an outdoor person. Um, bottom right, Ah, opinions. I'm very opinionated. Any word on this uh, word cloud that resonates with you, circle it. Circle as many as you think. There, there's not a number. And then we're going to begin to examine that and see how it actually uh, fits into what a career might be for you going forward. Teachers, I'm just going to pause here for a moment and allow students some time to work on their work cloud. Okay, so we've circled all of those words. What we want to do now is just flip on over to page four in your workbook. And it's sort of what do you bring to the journey? I want you just to list maybe two or three things in each of these boxes in terms of your interests. Interests are what do you like to spend your spare time on? What sort of interests do you have? And then again, what skills do you have? I know how to, I know how to play soccer. I know how to figure skate. I know how to bake pies. I know how to do carpentry. I know how to lay carpet. I know how to do car repairs. What skills do you have at this point? And then your strengths. People tell me that I've got a, a real strong work ethic. People tell me that I'm really good mathematically. People tell me that I work really well with my hands. What are some strengths that you have? And then in the other square there, what are your passions? What are your dreams? What is it that you would like to see accomplished with your life? If I could, I would, if I could, 
I would be a rock star. If I could, I would be a public speaker. If I could, I would be a teacher. Let's begin to look at those because when we do that inventory of who we are and what we bring to the journey, all of a sudden that which perhaps had been cloudy begins to have some clarity. So let's spend let's just a couple minutes, maybe two minutes on that, and then we'll come back. Okay, just below that on your workbooks on page four is the matching to career cl clusters. I want you to look back at the word cloud and I want you to see where you tended to circle the most words. Okay, so we've drawn this into some quadrants here. I want you to think how many of you, your A1, A1 in that, uh, that upper section, that's where you see the most of your words were circled. And, and it, this isn't, you only can choose one, um, but if you've got a lot of words circled in that area, I want you to think about that because it says that, that people that circle words in that area or have an interest or something resonates with them there, they, careers in agriculture, food, natural resources might be a natural fit for you. A2. People that circled words in that area, that A2 area, education, training, you're, you're one that likes to give of your knowledge you want to learn and you want to, to expend out. A3, science, technology, engineering type careers. And so you can start thinking that way. There's just something really fulfilling when we begin to say, ah, that's the way I tick. That's what makes sense to me. And, and this isn't meant to box you in, but it's meant to have you explore. The, I, I remember when I was your age, I thought I wanna be a teacher. And really in my mind, I only thought there, there were probably five or six different careers I could explore. But you're living in one of the best times in all of human history because there are more jobs now than there have ever been at any time before, and they're exploding like this. New jobs are being created. There are going to be jobs in three years that we haven't even contemplated yet. So what an exciting time in history that you are living. And so this exercise is meant to make you just sort of expand your thinking and begin to explore different areas that perhaps uh, you hadn't given consideration to before. If you circled mostly in the B1, we're looking at health sciences, nurses, doctors, physiotherapists, chiropractors, lab techs, that sort of thing. B2, architecture, construction, you're able to conceptualize and bring things to reality. Uh, B3, finance. Uh, you're, you're a numbers person. You're good with that. You're good with planning and appropriating in that regard. B4, transportation and distribution. We're, we're living in an age where goods are shifting, shifting back and forth across borders like never before. And careers in logistics and planning and distribution and transportation might be something you want to explore. C1, law and security. You're a rules person. You're, you're able to uh, discern and implement and live uh, according to some pre-established boundaries. C2, hospitality services and tourism. Again, all around the world, people are traveling uh, like they have never traveled before and exploring new destinations. And there's just a, a real... Um, need for people who are people people to be able to to express themselves in those careers uh, c3 if you circled a lot in that area that c3 area of the chart arts audio video technology communication c4 government and public administration policy establishing working um D2, marketing, sales, and service. D3, human resources. You're able to work to support and to provide opportunity in the human resource section, working with people. Uh, D4, business administration, management, 
so if you've circled a lot of words down in that area, perhaps those are areas that you need to begin to explore as well. So let's look at some future considerations here and the future considerations video. Let's ask students some important questions about their hopes for their future lifestyle and what it will cost. What do you see in your future? Pay attention. These are questions you should ask yourself to prepare for what lies ahead. What do you imagine your life to be like at 30? When I'm 30, I hope to have an established career. As for my living conditions, I like to live in the city. Do you know what it costs for your future home? I'm not exactly sure how much a condo will cost. So I know per week they range from like $500, so it comes around $2,000 a month. Do you know how much it costs for post-secondary education? I'm personally going to be expecting $15,000 a year. Other schools have it less, other schools have it more. Personally, for the university I'm going to, I'm expecting about ten to $12,000 for residence. Eight to $9,000 a year. I think it also depends on what kind of career you have. But when you're going internationally, I know it's a lot more. It can come up to $36,000 a year. Do you have a budget? Uh, personally, I have a budget. Going to university, having a budget is essential because you're not only paying for residence, you're paying for textbooks, meals, sometimes I go out for entertainment and whatnot. So that's huge. Where did you learn about budgeting? I personally learned here at school. We had a junior achievement program come in, and that's where I learned. What is the difference between college and university? I've been told that university is more for careers that involve thinking and more theoretical, while college is hands-on. So if you were to become a hair stylist, you'd be going to college. How should you prepare for post-secondary? If you don't know what fields or interests you have, I definitely suggest taking an aptitude test. Keeping your grades up is um, a huge part of it because there is a lot of competition. Go on the university's website, and if you have any questions, you can ask your buddy. Really, it's, it's very tough to figure out what you're Oops, had a little bit of problem there. Let's just get back on course. Sorry, we had a little glitch in uh, the video there, but we can resume. Oh, back we go. Um, if you don't know what fields or interests you have, I definitely suggest taking an aptitude test. Keeping your grades up is um, a huge part of it because there is a lot of competition. Go on the university's website, and if you have any questions, you can ask your guidance counselor. Really, it's, it's very tough to figure out what you, what you want to do at that point. But what you can assess is like your skills, for example. I believe that when you're in high school, when you're transitioning through there, join a lot of clubs, reach out to different organizations, like clubs, organizations, those are the things that get you through the farthest. What do you think is starting pay for a university grad? First of all, it really depends on the major, in terms of the, the, the demand for the job. But I think personally, the average you can expect around forty-five to 55000 What is the average pay for a part-time job? I personally get paid ten seventy-five. I get paid thirteen fifty. When you're in the workplace, is it crucial that you conduct yourself in ethical ways? And what does it mean in ethical ways? Well, I think it's important to not cause much conflict in, in a workplace since it's a professional environment. And also because um, when you ever, whenever you see some some conflict going on, you should try to report it, or you should even like maybe step up and try to resolve it yourself. Ethics is basically just doing the right thing, and it's like it comes back to your morals as a person. It's important to think about what you want out of your future and the realistic expectation of what everything will cost. Plan ahead, budget, and you can reach your goals. I think that's a real good reminder. And on page five of your workbook, it, it helps you explore some of those questions and answer some of those questions for you. But as you begin to think about how you want your life to unfold and, and those goals again that you're setting for yourself, it's important to, to deal in facts, to find out how much is it gonna cost me to go to university? I remember when our eldest daughter decided she was heading to university and, and she was moving away from home to attend university. 
and it was going to cost you $25,000 a year. That's tuition uh, and living in residence or renting her own place, $25,000 a year. So then we're thinking, okay, how do we pay for that? And you need to explore, am I going to get student loans? Are there scholarships I can apply for? Grade nine, grade 10, you're at the excellent stage of life to begin to really look at these things because there's a saying if you fail to plan you plan to fail and so i really want this session for you to be about thinking ahead and then saying okay what plans do i have to make to get me to where i'm going and if there are scholarships that you can apply for then start bringing your life in alignment and thinking okay what are the scholarships what are they looking for how do i prepare so that when i hit that grade 11 when i hit that grade 12 i am ready and i know so count the costs know how much things are going to cost you know what you're going to make when you uh, move out and, and graduate from some of those programs. What is the difference between university and college? And I think as you explore those, again, on page five, uh, there are a lot of the answers. So let's just look at page five quickly. As we begin to examine different careers and, and where we fit and, and what our aptitude is, what are some of our areas of interest, I think that we need to look, and, and there's some opportunity here for you, to look at occupations. And if we look at, say, Henry Ford, he, he was the first to really establish an assembly line mode of production. He was making the first car. And before uh, Henry Ford made an assembly line mode of uh, production, what they would do is they'd take a single mechanic and they'd give them all the component parts and say, build me a car. And they began to realize that was becoming too expensive and too time consuming. And so they moved to an assembly line mode of production. And this was the way cars have been made for decades and decades. But now we see that automation and, and robotics and all of this are coming in and it even uh, heightens the efficiency, brings it to a new level. So as we look at occupations, as we consider different occupations, actually the need for assembly line workers, which might have been really, really prevalent in the 1950s, 1960s, is now a declining industry because uh, assembly line workers are being replaced by automation. Same with, if we look on this chart here, data entry clerks. When I first entered the workforce, everybody had a secretary. Everybody was inputting data. Now, much of that is being done automated. People are no longer needing the support people they needed before because they're able to do it themselves through automation. Uh, so those would be some of the declining opportunities. Now, there are some neutral opportunities. Those aren't trending up or they're not trending down. They're just remaining somewhat static or stable. Uh, dentists, we're going to need dentists till the end of time. Accountants, uh, there's always those that are going to be able to advise and, and look through books and, and bring order in that regard. Uh, EMS workers, fire, police, ambulance always needed lab techs, lawyers, I would say funeral directors, uh, there's always going to be a need for those types. So those are neutral careers, they're not trending one way or the other. And then there are also careers that are really a rising opportunity, call center operators, more and more, we have so many appliances, and things around our house that, that sometimes we just need help with. Maybe it's our online banking. Maybe it's my computer to tech support. Maybe it's my cable coming into or high speed coming into my house. So call center operators, uh, people are demanding more and more for 24 hour service. And so a really rising opportunity is for call centers and call center operators, childcare and personal support workers for the elderly. We know 
more than, you know, say four decades before us when there was always a parent at home. Now we have both parents in the workforce. And so that need for childcare is a rising opportunity. And equally, we have an aging population. And so as those baby boomers are moving through and coming to that place where they're needed, needing some extended care, uh, there is a real rising opportunity for support workers for the elderly. Uh, same with doctors, people are living longer. And so that medical support uh, is there. And so I think as we look at, at opportunities, as we look and consider occupations, it's good to sort of identify, is this a declining opportunity? Is this something that's staying in the middle and it's sort of neutral? So it's just always going to be there or is it a rising opportunity? Because as I said, there are things that um, there are jobs being created right now that we can't even get our heads around at this moment, but in two years or in one year, they're going to be there. And so we want to sort of ride the crest of that wave. Again, here are some more, the declining opportunities uh, or the, the neutral opportunities. Uh, rising opportunities, ecotourism guides, really, nanotechnology engineers and researchers, social media experts, data ana an analysts, all of those. But when you look at neutral, there's always going to be a need for teachers, of veterinarians, of pet groomers, of power linemen, of x-ray technicians, and then some of the more declining. When we, when we look and say, is that area going to a place of automation, then we're probably on a decline in terms of um, occupation or opportunity. So here, here's some qu answers to your questions in regards to college, university. If you've got a kit, th this is a game within your kit that teachers, you may want to pause and play it this time. But uh, we want to look at the college, university, apprenticeship, the Jeopardy game. And, and here are some of the answers to that. So finding balance and and you know if you talk to anyone that's sort of that uh, 30 years and above that work life balance that that whole thing is, is is something that adults love to talk about and and so i grade nine, 10, you're sitting there and thinking, oh, what does that really mean for me? But I want us to explore that because I think it really speaks to, again, who you are and how, what are your goals? What, how is it that you want to live your life? So here we go. When we're just going to look at a few things here. I want to play a game just and you guys can shout out the answers, but it, I think it's important that as we think about where you're going and you're going to be living on your own and we're going to do some exercises in the next little while that have you sort of look at that. What does it actually cost you to live alone? And so we're going to play a game. It's sort of like if you've ever watched The Price is Right and you're going to tell me is the price on the screen low or is it high? OK, so let's go. A jug of milk. How many of you have bought a jug of milk lately? Do you think $7 a jug? Is that a low price or is that a high price? $7 for a jug of milk. It's high. It's high. Milk usually comes in at about that three fifty four, dollars depending on the region of the country that you live in. Okay, orange juice. Uh, a big jug of orange juice like this, $1.99. Does that seem like a low price or a high price? It's low. Orange juice is expensive. Do you know how many oranges actually go into making that jug of juice? Again, that's a low price. Here we go, a loaf of bread, 99 cents for a loaf of bread. What do you think? Because these are things that you're gonna buy when you're out on your own. You're gonna buy the milk, you're gonna buy the bread, you're gonna buy the juice. Um, what do you think? $99 for a loaf of bread. 
it's low bread costs money and it's something that you know maybe at home living at home you're used to eating four pieces of toast a, a day or having a couple of sandwiches well you're going to begin to count the cost um as you begin to move out and, and understanding i think how much things cost actually puts you in good stead it, it puts you on a firm foundation so that you can make good decisions moving forward and that's really what we're wanting to do with this economics for success program is to have you know where you want to go and then make the decisions that get you there okay peanut butter 2.99 for a jar of peanut butter what do you think is that price low or is that price high you're right. It's low again. Things cost more than we actually think sometimes. And and uh, peanut butter is one of those things that you'll soon discover that it's a bit of a luxury. How about a dozen eggs? A dozen eggs for $4.99. That's 12 eggs. Uh, 12 eggs. I'm telling you, can last you a long time. So what do you think? 12 eggs for $4.99, low or high? It's high. Eggs are actually quite an economical choice in terms of protein and, and being able to use them as you go through and you're living on your own. So eggs, maybe two, three dollars for a dozen. And so depending again where you live and where you're sourcing them from. Chicken breasts, $4.99 for chicken breasts. Do you think that's low or do you think that's high? Okay, let's look at that. Chicken breast, that's low for chicken breasts. Chicken breasts, and again, that can, depending on supply and demand, there are times when chicken breasts can be quite available in the supermarkets and, and they have a lower price, but then there are other times where three chicken breasts could cost you as much as $12 or something like that. And so you really want to look, and same with the fruits and vegetables, if they're in season, that means if, the, if they can be readily picked locally, they're gonna be a lower price than and if they're growing and shipped from Mexico or, or uh, somewhere else. So think about the production costs. If the closer they are to you and the more in season they are, the, the lower the price is going to be. Frozen pizza, $3. You guys probably know this one. Um, what do you think? Low or high? It's low again. Frozen pizza can be expensive. A one bedroom apartment, one bedroom apartment. And again, there's some variance across the nation um, or even city to city, but a one bedroom apartment. So you got one bedroom, a kitchen, a bathroom, small living room. What do you think? $400 a month. Is that low or high? It's low. It's really low. Apartments can be really expensive and there are different types of apartments you can get. You can get a bachelor apartment, which really is one room with your bedroom, your living room sort of in one area and your kitchen. So it's an open concept, but it is tiny. And then uh, a bathroom. Sometimes there's even shared bathrooms. So you really want to look. And when you're looking for an apartment, you, some things you want to consider is, are utilities included? That means do you have to pay separately for your, your power or your gas to heat and light your home? Uh, what about your water? Is it included? Wi-Fi is an, another cost that you could be having to consider. Let's look at a desktop computer. You guys know this stuff, I'm sure. Now, what about a desktop computer? Could you get one for $200? No. Uh, perhaps if you were buying used. And, and those are decisions that you want to make. Are you going to buy new or are you going to buy used? Because as you think about some of these things, are there areas you can cut back in where you don't mind if it's a used product? Or I remember when we were young and... and students often came they didn't have furniture for their apartments or their dorms or whatever and so they'd take a big box they'd find a big box put a tablecloth over it and that would become their table um milk crates you know those those plastic milk crates they they would use those for shelving units so you're gonna have to make some decisions because 
where you are now is going to be some steps to get you to where you are. If you come out of the gates and think I need everything, just like my parents had it, I need to eat the same way I ate with my parents. I need to have the same quality of stuff. You might end up behind the game because you're going to incur, incur a lot of debt. Again, remember when you're making those decisions going forward, you want to count the cost. And this is what we want to do today is have you pause and really think this is how much things are going to cost me. So what what decisions do I need to make along the way to get me to where I'm going to go? Okay, cell phone with data, $20 a month, low or high? You're right, it's low. Uh, $70 a month might be more reasonable. So we're going to do in your workbook, the cost of living challenge and, and what you have in, in your kits teacher are some scenarios, some job scenarios, how much you're making. And, and one of the biggest shocks you're going to see here um, are the cost. This is a job at Pete's Pizza. And someone may say, oh, well, you're going to make $13 an hour or whatever. But what are the deductions? that are going to come off of your paycheck. I want us to stop and just really look at this for a minute and notice uh, what the gross pay is and what the take home pay is. Okay, so as we're looking at this, um, teachers, you can have the students work independently right now. We're going to walk through uh, pages seven, eight, and nine. 10 and 11 in your workbooks. And you're going to spend quite a bit of time, you know, half hour or so doing this. Uh, and what we're going to do, and I'll go through the instructions and then we'll pause and let you work on that for a while. But on uh, page seven, here's an example of a monthly budget. Okay. So how much are you going to spend for rent? And if you look on page eight, there's some sample pricing uh, available to you. So how much are you going to pay on rent? Utilities, that's your water bill, your power bill, your, ele your electrical, your gas bill, anything that, that powers and sources your uh, living accommodation or your telephone, those are utilities. Transportation, are you going to have your own car? Or do you have a car loan? What's the cost of your gas? Good rule of thumb is, is however much you spend on gas that you put that away in an account for repairs on your vehicle. So what are your transportation? transportation costs. So you're going to take the bus. Maybe that's a more economical decision for you. Food. Okay. When you're thinking about food, I want you to think, but how much you eat in a day and some of those things that we looked at before, what would, what would the cost be? And if you can sort of break it down and take into account that you're probably going to eat out sometimes. And so what would be that daily cost of consumption for your food? Um, how much would it cost to have two pieces of toast for breakfast, maybe an egg, a uh, sandwich for lunch, and a chicken breast and a salad for supper, say. Okay. Uh, and then multiply that by, let's go for a 30, just a, on an average. Um, for a, We're looking for a monthly total, estimated monthly budget. So we want to look at that. And then furniture. Again, we're going to look at those decisions that we had. Are you going to buy new? You're going to rent? You're going to buy used? You're going to improvise with some milk crates and, and cardboard boxes? What about entertainment? Most people don't budget for this, but it's an important thing when you're establishing a monthly budget. Again, a monthly budget allows you to plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You plan and then you work towards that and you know this is how much has been allocated for this certain thing. So entertainment. Are you going to go to any movies? Um, are there any concerts or uh, screenings or anything that that you would you going to go out to the bar? What you know, what are the decisions you're going to make that would fall into that entertainment? And and people fail to budget there and then all of a sudden they're down three hundred dollars a month really give some thought to what you're going to do for entertainment. Cell phone, make sure you budget there. Clothes. Now, um, again, is Value Village, is Salvation Army your shopping place or, you, or are you a Louis Vuitton type of person? Um, I think that 
again, a saying short-term pain for long-term gain. When you, when you move, when you transition from living in your parents' home to your career or to university or whatever, you might feel some pain at first, but that pain of living a little bit more tighter than what you want to do in 10 years, that's going to pay off. So short-term pain for long-term gain. What, where are you going to be on your closing budget? Some people say, you know, what? I'm not having a closed budget. I'm going to live with what I have. And then for my birthday and Christmas and that, I'm going to ask for those things. And then miscellaneous, it's always good to budget in um, some wiggle room for, the, for those things that shampoo, toilet paper, you know, things that you have to pay for, um, sunscreen and Coke. You know, maybe you like a coffee a day. Are those in your miscellaneous category? And then if you're going to go to university, your startup costs, you know, what's it going to cost you to move to the city you're moving to if you're moving? What's tuition? Because when you think about your university or post-secondary education, you've got tuition costs, you've got books, there are fees that are there. Then there are your living costs. Are you living in dorms? Are, is there a food budget included or are you living on... On your own and those uh, numbers would be allocated as we had discussed previously. So as we look, we're, we're talking about let's, this is your moving day. This is you're moving out of your parents' house. You're moving in to your own place, whether that be for university or you're moving on to a job or something like that. And so I'm referencing, referencing page nine in your workbook right now. Do you have any monthly debts? Okay. So car payments, um, student loans anything like that. So we're going to start looking again at that. And some things to consider um, when we talk about a place to live, if you have a place just by yourself, that's probably the most expensive option for you. But if you share with a roommate, so if you find a place and the rent on that place, say it's a two bedroom for $1,000 a month, then you're gonna obviously divide that amount in half and your budget's going to be that $500 a month, okay? So, or if you have three roommates, some, maybe you're gonna do four roommates with two sets of bunk beds. Like, what are you gonna do to bring your costs down? And I think of it as we fill in that first um, column, the monthly budget, you may see that ah, I gotta revise this a little bit. So what areas are you willing to pull back on? Because when we're, looking at a budget and we're faced with um, there's more month at the end of the money, uh, then we have two choices. We either increase our revenue, we increase the amount of money we're making um, by taking on an extra job or something like that, or we reduce our expenses. And this is something that's going to happen for the rest of your lives. It doesn't matter if you're 15 or 50, you're going to come up against some of these challenges, these budgeting challenges. And your choice is always either increase the revenue, increase the amount of money incoming, or reduce your expenses. And so oftentimes it's good to make that monthly budget column and then the revised monthly budget. So when you look at that place to live, same with utilities, TV and internet, if you're living with two or three people, you take that total cost and then you divide it by the number of people living. Now, oftentimes you think, oh, well, let's get roommates, let's get roommates. It's really important when you have roommates that you have an agreement um, because many, many people have roommate scenarios that go that just don't turn out the way that they had hoped. And what if a roommate doesn't make rent one month? Can you carry that cost? What are you going to do about that? So really, again, when you have the end in mind, start thinking through the different scenarios. And even in terms of the moving day challenge, if we go back to that initial big goal, ultimate um, goal triangle, here's what I want and what are the steps that need to take me to where I'm going to go. 
So teachers, we're gonna have them work through that on page nine in the workbook. And we'll pause and, and give some good time for reflection and, and consideration there because you're gonna have to make some life decisions. That's what this is, pause, check, ah, reality check. How much are things going to actually cause? Let's pause and do that right now. Okay, we're back. And now we're back to those scenario cards, the payday scenario cards. And we're gonna start looking at those and weighing them against that monthly budget. We're gonna say, okay, this is how much my total monthly living expenses were. And then we're going to look at your paycheck, um, your gross pay. And gross pay is simply what you earned before taxes and deductions came off of that. Uh, pay and your net pay. Net pay is what you actually take home. So even if someone says, hey, you're going to be making $20 an hour, that's not what you're going to be taking home. So an error that many people make is they do that calculation $20 an hour. Oh, that means I'm going to be making X number of dollars a month. And they plan according to that. But if you're going to be really responsible and make those decisions that take you to where you want to go, you want to know specifically how much is your gross pay? What's your net pay? What were the deductions that came out? Because some of those you'll be able to get back when you file your income tax. And then what is your monthly net pay? And so your monthly net pay, net pay, the amount you take home, uh, that's caught in your net um, minus your total monthly living expenses equals your balance. And we want to make sure that there's a balance there. You want a plus number or at least an equal number in that category. If it's a negative, you need to go back and you need to rework your budget. You need to make some hard decisions. Where am I going to cut back? Now, one of the places that people often cut back when we do this exercise. They say, oh, I'm going to cut my food budget. I budgeted way too much for food. Yes, that is an area you can pull back on, but let's be realistic. Let's figure it out because if you pull back on your food budget, you're going to still have to eat and uh, you'll end up eating out and your those, those dollars are actually going to exceed. And so you this is this is reality check moment okay so how much are you taking home minus how much are your living expenses and what's your balance and then what do you need to go back and rework okay you finished that activity and, and i think for some of you i remember one of the first classes that i went into and, and Students were coming up with like a $5,000 a month na uh, monthly budget. And I'm like, come on, how much do you have to make? And I want you to do this just for a minute. How much would you have to make in gross pay to be able to afford expenses of $5,000 a month? Remember, $5,000 a month, if we're going to just do a balanced budget, that means that you have to, your net pay has to be $5,000 a month. Now, if we go for a tax rate of, say, 35 40% on top of that, and then any other deductions, what, how much would you have to be making? Let's stop and do a quick calculation. Okay, you've done that calculation. So that's why it's really important that, that we begin to live within our means. We, we always wanna have a plus number at the end of our budget so that we have some that we can be putting away and saving for a rainy day fund or perhaps for something that we're saving for or even our future and, and our pension and all those sorts of things. So you want a plus number there, but let's look at some of the strategies that we're gonna to have to uh, embrace as we move forward. You guys have some big goals. And when I think about the ultimate goal in that very first exercise uh, on page two, what are some of the success strategies that you're gonna to have to implement to get you to that place? I think one of the things that that's really important is um, and a realization that that we all come to at some point in our life is you get one chance to make a first impression. 
the good thing again about life is you can always make another impression, but one chance to make a first impression. So we want to make some good first impressions. And I think one of the things is, and we're going to talk about how to introduce yourself. And so let's just look at that because that's often the very first encounter you have with someone is the way you introduce yourself. So let's have a look at this video. Introducing yourself is extremely important. Whether it's a job interview, volunteer opportunity, or at a public event, it is the first impression that someone gets from you and it can leave a lasting positive or negative impact. So you want to make sure you come off confident, professional, and articulate. Don't hug, fist bump, or try a secret handshake. Keep it simple. When you shake hands, don't squeeze too tight or shake it too lightly. Shaking too long can be awkward to see who lets go first. Don't look down or away. Remember not to mumble. Try this. Outstretch your hand as you greet. Connect the hand palm to palm as you grasp firmly, but not too far. Shake two or three times while smiling and keep eye contact. Introduce yourself by speaking clearly and state your name. Here are some examples of four introductions. Hi, we are Holly. I'm Fish. Let's do that for a moment. Let's take some time and just go around and introduce ourselves to each other. And we know that sort of the, the mode of introduction has changed during COVID days. People aren't uh, shaking hands like they used to, but a simple acknowledgement, a, a, a nodding of the head. Hi, I'm Catherine. And make sure that you say your name slowly. Not, Hi, I'm Catherine Gagne. Hi, I'm Catherine Gagne. You want to pause, you want to look people straight in the face, a smile um, causes one to be welcomed. And so you want to be able to upright, if you have what I call sweaty palm syndrome, just a quick wipe on your pant legs, and then you can go in if you're going to go for the handshake. But again, you want to have, you want to be inviting. The purpose of the introduction is to establish rapport. And so it's really important that you make that eye contact, that you're smiling, that you're going in, that you clearly pronounce your name. If you have a name that is hard to pronounce, like mine is Gagne, oftentimes if it's a first time, and depending on my audience, I may say, hi, my name is Catherine Gagne. You know, you say my name, Gagne. Like when I leave, you're going to go say, hey, she's gone, yay. Um, give them some sort of anchor or point to remember you and your name. If we turn to page 13 and four, to 15 in your workbooks, I personally think the this is a section that I would, until I'm 30 years old, keep and resource and reference um, as you go through the next stages of life, as you transition into that place of having a career, because there are some things in this section that are just outstanding and they help you begin to contextualize what it is that you bring as an offering. Because when you're looking at getting a job, an employer wants to hire someone that brings value to their business. And so you need to think, okay, at age 15, 16, 18, 25, what is the value that I bring to the business? And oftentimes it used to frustrate me when employers would say, well, what experience do you have? And I'm like, well, if you'd give me a job, then I'd have experience. But as you begin to get these 
jobs in the next 10 years. I want you to think about this. And let's turn to page 13 and 15. And what I want you to do, and we'll spend, you know, five minutes, maybe reading through everything in the green column. And if that relates to you, if you say, yes, that's something that I like, or I do, or, or whatever, then put a check mark there. And then we're going to um, come back and look at what it is and how you then translate that into an employable skill. Okay, as you have looked through and you've checked off everything there, let's just look at a few of them because I think it's really important to be able to communicate and be able to articulate what it is that you bring of value to an employer. And again, as I said, make sure you put the junior achievement experience on your resume. I think that's really important. To, it, employers might say, tell me about that experience. What did you learn? And, and you need to be able to to share those types of things. And, and it's hard when you're sitting in a place where you don't have a lot of experience. And so how do you communicate what it is of value that you would bring to an organization and to a company that you're working for? If you checked off the first uh, uh, item on page 13 that says, I enjoy playing fast paced, exciting games like laser tag, or online games, I'm telling you, if I was the employer and I'm sitting down and I'm interviewing you and I said, so tell me about yourself. What do you bring of value? And you say, well, I like playing laser tag and online games. I'm a real video gamer. I would not be one that says, hey, that's the person I want to uh, employ. But if you look down the orange column, that becomes the employable skill. If you say it this way, I'm observant and I react quickly. I work well under pressure. I'm like, that is someone I want to employ. See, it's the exact same thing. The skill set is that you're a video gamer and you like to play laser tag. That's not an employable skill, but you're able to communicate and articulate what is the place of value that you bring to the employer. And then, so if you say, you know, tell me about yourself. I'm observant and I react quickly and I respond well under pressure. For example, I learned these skills playing video games on and uh, uh, laser tag. That's fine. Tell the story, but give the employable skill first. So that's why I say pages 13 to 15 in your workbook, you want to keep this. You want to rehearse this. You want to understand what the employable skill is uh, on page um, 14, sort of halfway down in the green column, there's one that says, I have babysitting experience and have been given a lot of responsibility at home. Now, lots of times that's the only thing you have to put on your resume and that's fine. But what's really important is you understanding the implications or, or what again is the value proposition? What is it that you're bringing to your employer that is of uh, value? And so tell me about yourself. Well, I am trustworthy and I am responsible. I, I have babysat th throughout my neighborhood. Um, I've opened a store. I, I was a facility supervisor at the school and opened the school for uh, sporting events. That shows responsibility. If someone's going to entrust you with their child, and you're going to look after that child maybe for a day, maybe you've done it for a weekend. That is really showing a trustworthiness and a sense of responsibility. And so your employable skill is that. So I want you to really go through the orange column and let's just spend a moment just highlighting a few of the things that we checked in the green column that we're going to translate and say to one another in with the language of the orange column. Can we do that just for, let, let, let's just do that for about five minutes. Okay, we're moving on to some big stuff now. Um, if you want your resumes to stand out, um, if you want to be what employers want, if you wanna be that type of a person, uh, then I want you to give some thought to our next slide. Social media, true or false? 
interviewers will google you so if your facebook page has an inappropriate picture and you're looking for a job get rid of it i really want to encourage you at this time that you're you're moving this is a this is a season of transition you're no longer a child you're moving into some adult responsibilities you're moving on you're maturing and so you need to put some childish ways behind you uh it's time to clean it up uh, I was out one day with some young people who had gone through our junior achievement program and they were out with a very prominent business person in our province and they asked him, hey, Mr. Hill, what about social media? Do you actually look at that? And his response was, you know what? Don't be so concerned with social media. Um, that's just the outcome. Be concerned with the conduct of your life. And you want to have good conduct. You want, and whatever you're posting should be a reflection of that. If you want an indicator of future behavior, past behavior is often the indicator. And so you want to make sure you're making good decisions and, and also posting stuff that is a true reflection of who you are. And so if you're, you know, always party person or you're using foul language and stuff as an employer, I don't want you representing my company. So come on, people, it's time to clean up your social media. It's time for you to begin to move to a place of responsibility. I was talking to some employers one day and they said, okay, so I received a hundred applications for this job. And my first level of screening is this quickly. I look at the application, I'm like, yes, no, yes, no and that quickly and i'm like how the heck could you make a decision that quickly and they said that on the applications the first line they're looking at is your email address and if your email address is sexy monkey upside down at hotmail.com you're going in the no pile if your email address is just simply your name at gmail.com you're going in the yes because think about it again have you put your childish ways behind you what how are you reflecting yourself? If you're sexy monkey upside down at, at hotmail.com, uh, there's, there's some things about your character that might be brought into question. And I'm just telling you, you might say, that's not fair. And yes, that might not be fair, but that's the way life is. And if you're going to move on and you're going to progress and you're going to achieve some of those goals you set for yourself, I want you to begin to move from a place of responsibility and also understanding what the rules of the game are. So again, as we start thinking about our social media, um, yeah, true. Employers say they, they often will Google someone before they hire them. True or false? Is it okay to use silly email addresses like love to party at Gmail? We just talked about that. It's false. There is a lot of competition for jobs. So why risk making a bad impression? True or false? If you had have had a bad employment experience, you should definitely post your anger and frustration online. Think about that. Where does that lead you? False. You might come off looking like a hothead or someone who rants about their employers. Would another employer want to be ranted about? Unlikely. So make sure that you're reflecting truly who you are and that you're moving to that place of being a responsible person and demonstrating such. True or false, social media sites like LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram can help you find a job. What do you think? Can social media sites help you find a job? Absolutely. Social media sites allow people to share who they are and what they're good at. And sometimes if you're looking for a job, even just put it out on your mom's Facebook or whatever saying, hey, I'm looking for a job. Here's my resume. Be in touch with me. LinkedIn, it's really good to get on there and start looking. True or false? Spelling and grammar don't matter when you're using social media sites, LOL. No, use the full words. Yes, they do matter. Uh, employers will judge you for your creative use of language. True or false? 
If you get asked to an interview, you should post it right away. Social media sites like Facebook and Twitter, mm -mm, false. It's great that you got an interview, but you should wait until you actually get hired to share the good news. So if you took turn it in your workbooks to page 16, uh, I want you to begin to look at your social media profile and let's spend some time uh, doing that at this time. So page 16, let's look at our social media profile. Let's do that exercise. Let's pause and then come back. Okay, we've looked at social media. Now we want to talk about the importance of mentorships. Uh, it's important to, when you sort of have an inkling of something you want to do, then get yourself around those type of people. And maybe you'll find out, like say if you want to be a veterinarian, why not volunteer at the Humane Society or the pet shelter or at a vet's store just even to do cleanup and, and be able to help out in that sort of way? Because you may discover in the midst of that 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 really isn't an area of interest for you. You want to be a teacher, start working in Sunday school, start working, helping out, volunteering, maybe at a daycare and seeing if that's something that you want to do. Again, it's really important for us to explore those op. So mentors, potential mentors. Um, you want someone that is someone you want to be like whether it's by career, profession, character traits, outlook on life. Um, you want someone that's a good listener, someone that's accessible and available to you. And it, it's good just to say, would you consider mentoring me? Um, help me build my character. Someone that is a role model to you. And, and it's really important. And on page 17, we look at that those sort of four criteria on what makes a good mentor. And I want you to think about that right now as we move to um, do that exercise on page 17. Who are some people that you may consider and, and what, are, what are some attributes they have that you're really wanting to begin to emulate and, um, and become? So now that we've finished that activity on page uh, 17 and we've had some discussion and given some thought to who, who possible mentors can be, it's so important to have people that hold you accountable, that, that provide that vision for you, that, that push you forward. And, you know, oftentimes it's our parents and things like that, but sometimes an outside perspective Perspective and that extra voice really gives us the push that we need to go in the direction that we're wanting to go. Uh, let's look on page 18 in your workbooks, some interview checklist of do's and don'ts. I think it's really important that we begin to, to look at some of these things that um, if you look on page 18, Make sure that you show up for a job interview on time. Make sure you dress appropriately. I was once told dress for the job that you really wish you had, um, maybe up a level from what you're actually, um, maybe you're going to be able to wear casual clothes at your job, but dress, dress up a, a level as you go. Make sure that you demonstrate a positive attitude when you're in there for a job interview. A smile goes a long way, making that eye contact, making sure that first place of engagement um, or introduction is done positively. And sometimes you have to act yourself in there that you got to really convince yourself and I often say this, if I was asked to sing tonight at a high school production, I would probably rehearse 20 times before I got off on that stage. Same thing with the job interview. I would get around some people, whether it's your teacher or your parents or your grandmother or even your mirror and begin to anticipate some questions and practice talking about them. Because yes, no answers aren't sufficient. You want to tell your story. And again, the point of the interview is to be able to communicate to the employer 
what it is of value that you bring to their organization or company. And you want to bring evidence back with that exercise that we did previously that you would be a good employee. So make sure that you use more than just yes or no answers and that you listen to what the question is. And if you don't understand what they're asking you, then stop and say, I, I'm not sure I'm at understanding fully what you want. It's okay to say that. Uh, make sure that you're making good eye contact, sit up straight, don't be slouching, don't be walking like this. Walk like you're determined that you're being purposeful in the way you present yourself. Don't chew gum. Turn your phone off. You don't want your phone going off during an interview. Better yet, leave it in the car. Don't even take it in with you. Um, don't mumble. Speak slower than you think that you need to because you want to clearly articulate. When you say your name, hello, pause. My name is Catherine, pause, Gagne. Because you want them to remember you. You don't want to say, hi, hi, my name is Catherine Gagne. They're like, what did she just say? Okay, talk to the interview, tell some story. Arrive five minutes early. Don't come there 20 minutes early, but most certainly don't get there late. You are communicating who you're going to be and what type of employee you're going to be. So I want you to really be responsible as you do that. And then a, something really good to do that causes you to stand out after your interview, hand write out a thank you card, send an email. It was a pleasure to meet you today. Again, it gives that extra layer of who you are. Take your resume with you, even though you've included it with the job application, maybe they haven't seen it. Come prepared and present yourself and bring evidence that you will be a good employee. I believe you can do it, okay? You're at a great stage of life, grade nine, grade 10. And as I said, the great thing, you may blow some interviews, you may do some real bad interviews, you may have made some mistakes already in life, but life always gives you a do over. So just when you know better, do better. Go back, correct some of those things. Let's start anew today. And let's make sure that we understand that as we're talking today with the Junior Achievement Economics for Success program, the economics for success are not just all monetary. It's an exchange of something I value for something you value. And your employers are saying, I value my business. What do you value and what do you bring to me in that regard? So let's begin to plan our success. And, and we can begin to do that on page 20, moving us straight through to page 22 in our workbooks. These workbooks, again, are designed to, for you to be reflective. They're not yes, no, right and wrong answers. They're about you and they're specific to you. And, and the more real you are with your responses, the more value you're gonna find through this program. <clears throat> so page 20, let's plan your success. Your qualities are, and this is sort of a recap of what we've already done in the, the different activities we've done that brought us this far. Your potential career, uh, career clusters from that early exercise. What are some different career clusters? And then begin to investigate, begin to Google. Okay, so agricultural jobs, what could some of those be? What, what area did I land on? What post-secondary options are there for you? Am I staying at home? Am I going to university? Am I going to a college? Am I taking a gap year? What are my options? Understand what they are. Because the clearer we can begin to see, again, the, the greater our vision, the more we'll walk deliberately towards that. And so that's why these exercises are really important. To manage my finances. Right? So many times it's finances which knock people off course. And so I really want you to get that and the importance of budgeting and even begin to practice that now. I know there's not a lot of money coming in or maybe not a lot of expenses, but begin to plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so just begin those initial steps. In order to manage my finances, I will need to four strategies to help me achieve my goals. Getting a mentor, 
might be a strategy. Applying for some jobs, doing an apprenticeship, volunteering. What is it that you need? What are some four strategies that you might want to employ to get you to where you're going? And then your big goal is, what ultimately is it that you want to do? What is it that you ultimately want to accomplish? And then we begin to work our way back, right? We begin to, if we're faithful in these small steps, we're going to be faith, more faithful even as we move up that, that pyramid. And that's what we want. So what opportunities lie before you? What are some things before you right now that you could engage in that are going to help you get you to where you want to go and maybe even along the way you're going to say you know what that's not something I ever want to do wow aren't I glad I figured that out at 17 rather than at 45. So we've got on uh, page 20 just for you to walk through again we'll take some time right now I think it's an important sort of career planning step um, a future planning step so let's pause Give some time to work through this now, uh, or maybe it's something you want to do on your own, but it, it's an important step. Planning is an important step because it gives you vision. And when you plan, it does not box you in. It lays something forward. And at any time, you can adjust that plan. But as long as you sort of know what you're pushing towards, where you're headed, the more deliberately you will walk to get there. So today, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to come in, give you uh, the tools, have you work through this workbook and begin to ask some internal questions and begin to reflect on who you are, what's unique to you, what sort of things do you enjoy? And then as we begin to bring our life into alignment with that, all of a sudden we see that we've got the, the economy for success. We've got what we need. There's an value exchange that's taking me to a place of success. And so I want to thank your teacher for having me in today. If at any time there's anything junior achievement can do for you, if you need a reference, if, if um, remember to put that on your resume, we're here for you. Junior Achievement in Saskatchewan. I'm Catherine Gagne, and it has been my pleasure to work with you today. Thank you very much.